and where you're joining and when you're where you're joining us uh, from today, that would be great. And we are recording this section um, and as well it will be streamed on Facebook Live. But uh, without further ado, since I know our time is tight, I would like, uh, on behalf of the Market Links production team, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Folaki Olayenka, who is the USAID immunization team lead and lead technical advisor for the COVID-19 Access and Delivery Unit. Dr. Olayinka, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Julie. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. Um, a very warm welcome to all of you participating in the webinar today. Um, really, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to say a few words. Um, and welcome to all of you from all around the globe. As you know, immunization has been a USID priority for over 30 years. And we work closely with partners around the world, including national governments, Gavi, UNICEF, WHO, um, of course, our key US government partner, the CDC, and many others, including civil society and private sector, to build strong routine immunization systems and extend equitable access to life-saving vaccines to all. USID's diverse portfolio of immunization programming contributes to our agency's priority to end preventable child and maternal deaths worldwide. USID has been a strong advocate of private sector engagement, particularly local private sector actors. You may have heard USID's administrator power speech recently that reaffirm our commitment to working with the private sector and local partners. So we are honored to have representatives from Apolartar, Hillard Packard, uh, Enterprise in India with us today to learn from their experiences. Since the start of the pandemic, there have been many examples of governments working with private sector in the COVID-19 response for testing, contact tracing, health information, isolation treatment, maintaining essential health services, and of course, the rollout of COVID-19 um, vaccines. While USID has had a lot of private sector engagement with many of our health programs, such as family planning and child health. In this space of immunization, it's still relatively uh, new um, for the delivery of immunization services, but it's an area that we are committed to supporting and growing in this work. We aim to learn from health areas that have worked with the private sector while addressing specific needs to ensure equitable vaccines access. This webinar today aims to stimulate the thinking and share practical ways to engage with and support the private sector to expand immunization. No global crisis in our lifetime has matched COVID-19 in scope in complexity and in scale. So fighting this pandemic would take every type of resource we have at our disposal. It requires urgent collective effort among government, civil society, and private sector, philanthropy, multilateral organizations, and other development international partners. The US government is leading the global fight against COVID-19 to end the pandemic and STEM, recover from the pandemic's widespread secondary effects. USID's leadership is pivotal and efforts to beat the pandemic include, as we all may recollect on September 22, President Biden convened the first of its kind global COVID-19 summit, ending the pandemic and building back better. This was to spur ambitious action among global heads of state 
international organizations, the private sector, philanthropies, NGOs, and other partners around the goals of vaccinating the world, saving lives now, and building back better. As we move into the webinar today, let me just conclude by saying a few uh, last words. Um, we know that the pandemic has really resulted in increased number of zero dose children, those who have not received a single vaccine. And we know that the efforts in ensuring equitable and high uptake has been, has really gone backwards um, for more than 10 years with more than 3 million children more not receiving a single vaccine in 2020 compared to 2019. This is very concerning, but we know that partnership with the private sector will be an important intervention and partnership for us to reach zero dose children. They are particularly found in urban, fragile settings, conflict settings, remote and very hard to reach, where thoughtful engagement with the private sector is needed. And so with this, I'm also pleased to announce that Momentum Private Health Delivery, uh, which is a USID funded project in collaboration with other Momentum partners is continuing to build on existing work and expanding the learning agenda so that USID can be an effective partner with the private sector to expand equitable immunization for all. With that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Chris Morgan, who is a senior technical advisor immunization in MPHD. He's also um, Japaigo senior advisor, and also to Arvind Pandya, who is our senior advisor uh, partnerships, strategic partnerships in USID India mission. And with that, I really look forward. Uh, to a very productive uh, consultation and webinar today. Um, over to you, um, Chris, for the first presentation. Great, thank you, Falaki, and um, good day to everybody. Thank you for joining us. It's an honor to represent the Momentum uh, suite of USAID activities, and particularly the private healthcare delivery stream uh, within that. Um, next slide, please. So as um, Dr. Ali Yinka said, the COVID vaccine rollout is demanding a whole of society response. And uh, uh, Momentum Private Healthcare Delivery with WHO and others did a call to action around this particular topic in uh, early 2021. But um, as mentioned, immunization traditionally is public sector and highly centralized. So the idea of engaging with non-government providers to deliver vaccines and immunisation programs is, is relatively new and relatively unstudied. Um, our focus in Momentum Private Healthcare Delivery is to really look at how the COVID um, vaccine rollout emergency response is working to include um, new actors and new sites of vaccination, such as factories, or um, uh, workplaces and new private health care providers um, in, in the vaccination process. Next slide, please. However, having said that there is not a lot of evidence, there is some evidence because the idea of private sector engagement in immunisation programs um, has been of interest, uh, at least for the last decade or so. And Momentum Private Healthcare Delivery has been collating the evidence um, that uh, is out there to date. And as you can see in, this, in the blue box on the right, there are a number of key evidence reviews that um, have been pulled together. And they resulted in 2017 in an initial World Health Organization guidance document on how immunization programs uh, could engage with non-government providers. And in 2017, 
the vision, the picture of classic immunisation program was one that was really oriented to the under five-year-old child. It was that classic uh, childhood vaccination program. And obviously with COVID vaccine rollout, things have changed. But from this evidence before COVID, we can say um, a, a few key things that are helpful. First is that um, in most settings, private providers proportionally have played a small role in um, uh, immunisation rollout compared, for example, to family planning or other areas where private providers are actually generally quite active. Private providers find a number of barriers to engaging in immunisation provision. Uh, looking at these reviews, though, there's a few different typologies which can help us to understand this. Um, the first typology is particularly in fragile and conflict-affected settings. Um, DRC is one example where in some parts of a country, the non-government providers, whether they be faith-based organisations or uh, NGOs or even uh, for-profits, uh, essentially replace government services because they reach places that government services uh, don't access. The second typology that we see is quite different. That's in places like India, Indonesia and Kenya, where the market is essentially segmented and there are some uh, healthcare um, clients who use private providers for vaccination exclusively and others who use the public sector exclusively. And, and in that mixed system, there's less interaction between public and private. And in that system, the private sector often provide quite a different mix of immunisation services than the government. Um, in many countries, though, the third typology operates where the private sector or non-government sector has a lesser role. And you'll notice I'm including non-profits and faith-based organisations within our broader definition of private for the purposes of immunisation discussion, um, which is different perhaps to other healthcare um, private sector discussions. From the literature, though, we can derive a few system interventions that are likely to work if scaled up. So direct funding of private providers or the franchising effect where um, private primary healthcare services in Kenya is one example, are branded to provide high quality care across immunization and other family care. But integration of both supply chain and um, uh, supplies and information systems and training programs has been the key to any example in the past literature where um, the private sector engagement has been helpful. Okay, next slide, please. So from all of this, there are some key risks and considerations that maybe will come out in the fireside chat, but particularly where on the left-hand side, private providers are providing immunisation services that are not standard um, and do not necessarily align with the, the government schedule for vaccines or types of vaccines that are, are provided. But I want to highlight the box in pink at the bottom for you. This is the most important point that in, in terms of where momentum private healthcare delivery is sitting now, is that we've got some evidence from the past that can apply to COVID vaccines, but what we're seeing in most countries is this rapid scramble just to roll the vaccines out against COVID. What we are really keen to do, which is on the next slide, please, and this is my last slide, is to invite you to a learning agenda. So as countries are rapidly rolling out COVID vaccination um, uh, services, how can we document, and there's three key asks in the box on the right, how can we document the new players that are being brought in to provide COVID vaccine? How can we understand what are the barriers and enablers to engaging those new players? And how can we use that information for the future to help us build back better and stronger immunisation programs beyond COVID um, into the long term, particularly programs that reach beyond childhood into older age groups, adolescents and adults. And uh, I'll leave this slide um, uh, in, in the notes for you to review afterwards, but we are really calling for partners to help us in this learning agenda.
I'd now like to hand over after a very quick review to Arvind from USAID India to present the uh, USAID India office uh, viewpoint on this. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Morgan, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Uh, thank you uh, for having us today to share a brief uh, uh, overview about our experiences and lessons on engaging the private sector. My presentation would be largely focused on our experience of engaging the private sector for COVID programs, but it also um, has the same sort of uh, lessons for both the routine immunization programs as well as the broader public health, uh, health systems programs. Before I get into my presentation, I just want to start with three important points. One, as Palaka mentioned, engaging the private sector is definitely an agency mandate. You said it's an agency mandate, but it is also becoming more a necessity to address public health priorities. Second, uh, some of the activities and approaches that I will be covering have either have been rolled out and then some are still at an ideation stage. So please keep that in mind as, we, uh, as I'm presenting to you. And third important point is that engaging the private sector can be fun and interesting and also sometimes tough and challenge. As you see in the slide, India's healthcare uh, industry is, is about 372 million, growing at a very uh, rapid pace of about 12% annually. 70% of the healthcare is provided by the private sector. The healthcare providers themselves are 70% are in the private sector. Startups and innovations in healthcare is booming. Government is much more open to engaging the private sector compared to a few years back. Example is the Ayushman Bharat, India's flagship uh, universal health coverage program. It has got a health and wellness center set program, which reaches to about 100, and, uh, they have about 150,000 health and wellness centers reaching to the most rural populations. Uh, the Ayushman Bharat also has uh, uh, outsourcing and strategic purchasing of the private sector. COVID has actually amplified the partnerships between the public and the private sector for public health programs. Uh, certainly from the slide, you will see that uh, a lot more uh, companies have been engaging, contributing, not only for, for not only contributing as in uh, CSR, corporate social responsibility resources, but they have also been uh, very mindful about their communities and their employees and investing a lot uh, for their welfare. Also, there have been a few, um, lot of efforts from the government side in terms of um, uh, providing loan guarantees, both for green and brownfield projects. Uh, in the box, you'll see a few examples of some of the companies that have been partnering with us. Uh, two of them are already there, uh, Howlett Packard and Apollo, who will be also sharing their experience. Next slide, please. Um, in fact, the COVID pandemic resurfaced some of the challenges that India's public health system and routine immunization programs are facing. Uh, many of you may have seen the news from PPE kits to oxygen supplies, transportation, cold chain, vaccines, human resource gaps, quality of healthcare services, uh, lack of an early warning system and financing. Many of these challenges was faced by India. It was a very grim situation when particularly the pandemic uh, wave two hit. Uh, these challenges and the, and, the, and the need for an emergency response actually required uh, greater partnerships with the private sector. Uh, and uh, while the private sector actually contributed from philanthropy, donations, corporate social responsibility, volunteering, uh, market-based solutions, uh, they were keen, but however, there was a lot of uncertainty even with the private sector on what to do how do we navigate the whole process? How do we ensure that there are results? So that's where USAID and several of the developmental partners uh, played a crucial role in leveraging and channelizing the private sector expertise and resources. Um, just to the next two slides, I'm not going to take too much time on the next two slides, but um, can I, yeah, these are some examples as to how we have supported uh, the private sector to be focused on improving the execution plans, the infrastructure, the surveillance, the capacity building and financing. Uh, the slides are, will be available with you. You will get more information about that. But I just wanted to highlight about the process that we had adopted. There was a surge of private sector's uh, support and we were really in the initial stages unable to manage the demand and supply. 
the government on the other side had their own priorities. They said, these products only we need support. This is the type of services that we want support. Foreign funds were flowing and we didn't know how to channelize those funds. So all those, uh, as well as the distribution and the monitoring of the various donations that were coming to USAID and to some of our part, to some of the programs. So a, a lot of discussions, engagements, coordinations were initially required to work with both uh, private sector, NGOs, healthcare facilities, governments, particularly the Ministry of External Affairs, and USAID had to actually take a lead role in that. And in some of the activities that was coordinated by the program. So this is how it started. After a certain point of time, the interest from the private sector started to slowly wane out because the supply was more than the demand. Uh, but then we really wanted to have the partners active, private sector to be more actively engaged. So some of our programs started with uh, what is we called as the Caring CEO Forum. And this Caring CEO Forum now has about 35 companies uh, as part of the forum. And largely it's an alliance, main, mainly meant to share the experiences because the companies themselves have been doing a workplace programs, donations, some social uh, support. So it's more, it was mostly a sharing of experiences understanding how vaccine work or rollouts can be happening in workplace programs and, and sort of investing in some of the opportunities. So that was the second approach that we took in terms of building an alliance. And I think uh, some of our partners, particularly Apollo Tires, who's got some experience in alliances will also be sharing that. The third, we wanted to make sure that we give a targeted messaging to the corporate. So we are started organizing PSC, private sector engagement roadshows in partnership with business associations. Again, in the PSC investment, uh, PSC roadshows, we gave them clear investment menus. For example, we had a VaxNow uh, program, which was to target, which was giving about for one and a half dollars, they were able to reach uh, uh, vulnerable and hard to reach populations with vaccines. Of course, the vaccines were given by the government or private sector in donation, but the whole cost. So VaxNow, vaccine on wheels, demand uh, generation, pairing partners, private sector partners, because some of them comes with big resources, some of them don't have the resources, some of them come with cash, some of them come with kind. So the entire pairing, all those things was, was sort of structured through PSE roadshows, which we had, and we had one now so far, and the second one is being planned, but this is the third approach that we had taken. And the fourth one is all about market shaping support. Uh, several new and promising ideas, whether it's uh, wastewater surveillance, whether it's telecare, uh, whether it's um, uh, financing, uh, blended financing, one of my colleagues, uh, Gautam, will be speaking more about it. All these were new ideas where the private sector uh, was keen. Uh, so that entire market shaping was supported by us. Uh, next slide, please. Next, next, next. I've covered this. Yeah, finally, to conclude, uh, these are some of the lessons what we as an agency, as, as India experience, I would say is that there are four uh, points that I would like to highlight. One, having a dedicated ag agency to channelize, be the interface between uh, non-governmental organizations, private sector, government, developmental partners really matters. They were able to do outreach. They're able to uh, work with private partners and come to a closure on the deals. They were able to provide technical assistance to implementing partners on what the private sector is looking for and how do you want to construct your structure, your programs. They gave us uh, the dedicated agencies was also working on some big ideas uh, and, it, and they played both at the retail space as well as the wholesale space. When I'm saying wholesale, taking a concept like digital health or surveillance and working this through, or when it comes to retail, it's taking one company and connecting to them to a particular uh, partnership opportunity. So having a dedicated agency is my is the first key lesson I would say. Second is identifying the interest and chart, charting appropriate pathways. Uh, many organizations come as just philanthropy. They come with CSR. They come with outcome-based financing, returnable capital. So the interest of the private sector also is varied. So um, uh, identifying the specific interest, what is the private sector's interest would be as a first uh, hand understanding would be very helpful because that could clear the expectations and also the success. Market. My last two points, having a flexi pool fund, uh, because some organizations have deep pockets, some organizations have resources, some organizations have smaller pockets. So having a flexi pool fund uh, is, is very helpful. And finally, uh, providing recognition to corporates, whether it's big, small, medium, large size, whatever is it, uh, giving the right spaces for them to be recognized and rewarded 
is, is also uh, enabling private sector engagements uh, into public health programs. I'll stop here. Uh, over to Dr. Susan Ross, um, Senior Private Sector Engagement Advisor with the Global Health um, Office of Maternal and Child Health and Nutrition, Nutrition USAID. Thanks so much, Arvind. Um, I'd love for the panelists to also come on camera. Um, it is my honor to be able to moderate this session with our distinguished panelists from India. Um, you've heard my colleagues talk about the fact that we really need a system to be able to um, develop uh, or, or to vaccinate um, people. So it's not just about service delivery. There are many things as supply chain, information systems. Um, and so I think, you know, in order to us to really effectively engage with the private sector, we actually need to listen to the private sector. So today we're going to hear from two corporate representatives on why and how they are working to expand immunization platforms. And then my colleague from USAID India is going to talk about the work that they've been doing on financing. Um, so please put your, your questions in the chat. Um, Chris will follow up when we go to audience Q&A. Um, and so now I'd like to hand it over to the panelists to introduce themselves and provide some brief opening comments. Um, Renika, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you to USAID's greetings to everyone. Um, I'm Renika Grover and I head sustainability and CSR for Apollo Tires. Uh, just to give you a bit of a context, we run um, a healthcare program for the trucking community, given the fact that they are our target audience as well. So there is a business linkage, definitely, because we have a maximum share coming up from there. But more so, we started this program because uh, the healthcare system for this community, which is a truck drivers community, is very, very frail and it, it's scattered. So we started uh, this program back in 2000 where uh, usually what you hear is the most of the stuff that comes out of out of is out of CSR, but that time corporate social responsibility was nowhere uh, in, in the limelight as well. So what we started as a healthcare program was HIV AIDS prevention program in partnership with ILO and, uh, and DFID as well, who gave us some kind of grant. But over a period of time, we realized that the truck drivers, uh, given the fact they're tedious lifestyles and they were almost like all, always on the roads, so their lifestyles were so tedious that they needed a proper healthcare system, uh, which was accessible to them at uh, their doorstep. So we introduced uh, other healthcare, emerging healthcare conditions, uh, you know, uh, provision of other healthcare uh, conditions as well, such as vision because um, I mean, in India, if you look, st still look at it, how many drivers you uh, see uh, wear spectacles. So that's something we started with. We also included uh, a, a provision of other healthcare uh, emerging needs such as tuberculosis, because I mean, the incidence rate of TB in India is the highest. And of course, uh, non-communicable diseases, which is diabetes and uh, high blood pressure as well. All of these emerging conditions, which, which I'm talking about, is something that we figured out were prevailing within the community. And that's where we started to provide the driver's community with, uh, a, a, you know, with, a, with a service, where we have healthcare centers, which are established in the transshipment hubs, where like these are commercial hubs, where the drivers have accessibility and they can actually approach it as well. So it's, it's a model that we introduced from the time of 2000 to now, we have actually grown exponentially. We have 32 healthcare centers across 19 states of India. And it's, uh, um, I mean, of course, I'll talk about it a little more, but it's more on partnership model because we realized that there was an essential need to involve other private players who were providing healthcare needs and not work in silos, but also look at having some kind of meaningful government partnerships and uh, the way Arvind was talking about is independent organizations who could who would who could provide us the conduit conduit between uh, you know like a a a, 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 a linkage between um, government and private players. So we looked at those as well. And uh, last day, just wanted to highlight in terms of as we progress, it was just not limited to, to tuberculosis. We've also started to look at provi provision of vaccination. Uh, to the truck drivers community. Again, 
which is something more accessible to them because the first thing in India that was a which was a, a you know like an uphill task was to create awareness amongst the community to actually get vaccinated as well. So that's something we've uh, we've started as well last year in this year rather in partnership with the government. So overall, it's it's I would say it's just a holistic service which is provision of essential needs to the driver's community, which whom we called uh, is the lifeline of the country. So, so that's uh, about the program in a nutshell. Over to you, Susan. Great, Ankara. Sure, so thank you very much for having me here. So uh, I think, uh, let me give you a very brief background of uh, what we have achieved. So let me see the, say the punchline first that since May, 2020, uh, we have managed to vaccinate around 1 million people in India. We managed to test 1 million people in India. So now let me give you a punch, the story behind this punchline, you know, because by the end of three minutes, if I make it, maybe you'll ring the bell and not allow me to say the punchline itself. So, so let's start with that. So the whole idea was that uh, around eight odd years back, uh, when we started our CSR program in India, uh, we actually uh, had a very nice opportunity that our uh, one of our software teams was developing a hospital management system. So what we decided was that why don't we use that hospital management system and try to come up with cloud-enabled e-health centers. So we picked up a shipping container and a 40-foot shipping container and we converted into a state-of-art e-health center. Uh, was started six years back and got different layers added to it, something like, you know, we added a call center, we established a telemedicine studio in PGI Chandigarh. Uh, uh, now we are sitting at 150 e-health centers who so far have served more than 2 million Indians. They provide around 70 diagnostic tests. Uh, they enable telemedicine facility and they're like completely state of art, you know, and they have a cloud, uh, a private cloud, which has been set up to store the EMR. And it, which is fully integrated to any medical, uh, you know, software in the country, whether in private sector or public sector. Now, what happened was in May or March when COVID happened, what we decided was that why can't we reorient our e-health network into a form that we can play some role in this COVID paradigm or COVID challenge which was facing us. We got in touch with IGIB, the Institute of Genomics and Integrated Biology. And we came up with our uh, COVID OPDs or outpatient uh, units where the people can be tested and kept in isolation for two days till the time the symptoms show up. And then they can be shifted to uh, a better facility. You know, at least what would happen is the other patients which are now bereft of using the hospital emergency services can come back to the hospital. You know why? Because the isolation aspect can be taken care of. Uh, we started doing that. We have currently 50 of these COVID OPTs operational around in 14 states in the country. Subsequently, when vaccination started happening, again, the government had a challenge that the primary healthcare ecosystem was not just meant to take care of the, the vaccine hygiene, which was required, you know? So what we did was that we picked up 100 e-health centers in again, 14, 15 states and fully converted them into state-of-art vaccination centers with all the medical equipment also thrown in so that in future, when they want to revert back to a prop, a e health center, a cloud enabled e health center, and carry on with your diagnostic test and whatnot, they can do that. So, so that's the story what we have done so far. Uh, so, 100 vaccination centers, 50 COVID OPTs, they're functioning fine. They're all in collaboration with government, state government, or the central government, because that's the mandate uh, right now in India. Is so far, we haven't faced any challenges. Uh, for vaccination, we started the tier one cities. Right now, we're in rural areas because the vaccines have started reaching there. Earlier, the challenge was that the vaccine was just available in few urban pockets to start with. So that's, we've grown. Sorry. That's very impressive. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to cut you off. But it's good you sorry, put the punchline first. Um, yeah, but so extremely like, impressive. Back to you. Uh, uh, to you. Gautam, over to you to talk a little bit about financing. And then we'll come back with some questions. Uh, thanks, thanks, Susan. Uh, so I believe uh, as far as uh, the USAID is concerned, uh, most of us are uh, really aware of the USAID focus on 
involving the private sector in the work that we do, especially in health. And Arvind, anyway, has spoken about the different approaches that we have uh, in USAID India to involve the private sector. I would like to highlight a few points. Uh, Ar Arvind uh, did cover uh, the involvement of uh, the corporate uh, social responsibility and the philanthropic funding and also the investments. But uh, I, I would just like to go into a bit details of that from the USAID point of view. When we engage the private sector, I believe uh, we need to understand there are two different appeals. So when we are involving the philanthropies and corporate social responsibility, the appeal is more the human side of the story, the qualitative, uh, basically appealing to the heart. And therefore, the way we mobilize the private sector and the way we mobilize money is very different from when we are looking for private investments. And that too in health, especially primary health care, where uh, the revenue streams might not be very clear or uh, very few, the margins might be very low. So instead of uh, appealing to the heart, we are basically appealing to the mind. And instead of qualitative uh, discourse, it's more like quantitative uh, cold uh, numbers and projections. So uh, for our USAID colleagues and also other partners, I think uh, these two separate ways of really approaching the private sector and mobilizing uh, needs to be understood, needs to be internalized. Because although uh, in totality, all have to come together, whether it's, whether it's the government, donor partners like USAID, the philanthropic uh, portion of the uh, private sector and the investment portion of the private sector. But the way you really uh, pitch a case, develop a business uh, uh, case for it, and really bring in the funds and the time horizon that we are looking at, like a typical USAID funding of three, four years might not be very conducive for a private investment, which might be actually looking at 10, 15 year horizon. So uh, with that caveat, I think uh, even within USAID, we do have the opportunity of using various tools Traditionally, uh, for mobilizing the uh, private resources, traditionally we had relied on the loan guarantees, but I think that does have a limited uh, benefit, but really to uh, build on it, maybe different ways of uh, looking at innovative blended capital uh, solutions, many of which currently with USAID grants we are not permitted to do, but that is where the other private sector, that is the private uh, financial sector, the banks and the financial institutions, the venture capitalists, they come in. And if we can all pull together, and I'll uh, also uh, later talk about some of the experiments that we have done. So in a blended finance way, uh, whether we are going for interest subvention, whether we are going for uh, retainable uh, grants, so all these things that USAID funds can't uh, be used for, that is where the others come in. So privacy engagement, not only for delivering the services, but also for financing, for delivering the services, there are different ways that we can do. So I'll just stop there and maybe uh, later I'll explain a bit more. Thank you. Over to you, Susan. Great, thanks. Um, so Annika, maybe um, I'll combine the two questions because I, I we're a little short on time, but I think, um, first of all, I'd love to hear kind of what lessons you've learned, particularly from working with the government. And then, you know, as Falake said, uh, we really see COVID as an opportunity in the long run to strengthen overall immunization systems. Um, and so I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Is that a question to me? Yes, please. Okay. So. Uh, the lessons which we have learned so far is that uh, uh, the partnerships have to be at local government level. That's the first lesson which we have learned because health is such a complicated subject that even a state level partnership sometimes doesn't work. So we've had examples of our e health centers failing just because the local administration was not even engaged in the whole exercise. So as much local as you can go, uh, it would be better for the sustainability of it, number one. Number two, uh, one lesson which we have learned and right now we don't have a solution to this is that, uh, you know, there's already a container in place in terms of, uh, when I say container or a conduit or a vehicle in place, which now needs to be augmented with more and more features. So uh, we've been reaching out to all other partner companies and other companies in the ecosystem, but we're you know, really not getting any solutions which can be loaded onto it because probably it's not falling within the ambit of their CSRs 
or maybe they would be more interested in selling it to a private sector hospital or something of that sort because we still a server and a supercomputer company if i may say so so only that much we can do frankly speaking in terms of envisaging a certain e health solution right now i know my solution works well but of course there are much better things in place so so one thing which probably usa it can help is that this uh, you know the, the solution which are developed let's say by american companies in healthcare or by american entrepreneurs or maybe by the ecosystem which is managed by the indo us corridor can be you know uh, brought together to create a bouquet of services and we already have a vehicle for that these health centers and these vaccination labs which we have set up so that's what i'd like to say on this uh, susan Great, thanks. So, um, Renika, over to you. I know you also work a lot with the government and other private partners. So, um, it would be great to hear any challenges you have as well. Sure. I mean, I kind of resonate with what Ankur mentioned. I mean, the, the level of partnership really helps, but it's at the local level, and that's something similar for us as well. But one thing I would also like to add, because we work with mobile population, which is very, very difficult to kind of reach out to as well. so one thing that really works which was a challenge earlier was community engagement because you have to have some kind of trust and goodwill build in this community for them to actually get vaccinated as well so what we did was we have a, a, a basically a pool of we what we call as peer educators or volunteers who are a part of the trucking community who are the people who actually take the placard and kind of spread the message and um over a period of or um, in the last because we've been running the service for nearly 20 years we have over 1000 active volunteers across india who are actually not on our payroll but they really really help support us so that's one clearly uh, a very distinguishing side the other thing the third th factor of course with the government of course being on uh, uh, you know on on board with us as well and that's something our vaccinations have kind of Uh, accelerated um, uh, as well but the third thing is is the partnership with our uh, you know like minded private sector so what we did was we formulated during the covid times in uh, june july we formulated partnerships with our oes who had something similar going on so uh, one of our key oes is a shopkin and so we actually formulated a partnership with them to spread uh, on you know on ground awareness through a telephone helpline which was which was started within like one month of when covid started to spread so it was just we started that because we had to make uh, drivers and it was in six languages so we had to create that awareness so these are the things which we had to kind of really really uh, you know accelerate overall i mean if i i mean ankur kind of triggered it that i should have actually mentioned we've reached out to nearly over like 6 million drivers community but our vaccination in just a span of 3 months we have managed to reach out to over about 100000 uh, driver vaccination 75% is the uh, people who've actually received vaccination for the first time first doses and 25% is the second dose So now we are through the drivers. We are trying to kind of cascade this information within their family members as well. How to get this on board? But the most important thing is to get those formulate those government partnerships where we wanted to leverage what the government had, and then sub you know just kind of complement it through our infrastructure, which has worked out brilliantly because we've actually managed to kind of get to uh, the deep pockets of India as well, where the drivers uh, you know kind of supply so, uh, they have the supply chain. So that's what I could say. Thanks. Thanks. Um, and then Gautam, is there any tools you wanted to share? Uh, well, Susan, as far as the tools are concerned, uh, as I was saying earlier, also uh, because investment side is a very different side of the private sector, and uh, from US aid, we do have some kind of risk cover thing uh, in terms of risk guarantee. But I believe there are uh, more things needed. especially uh, uh, new instruments like uh, say retainable grants or in times of covid things like uh, some kind of a interest subsidy that the borrower uh, who is a social entrepreneur need not return the interest and the interest is guaranteed through somebody so for these uh, i think uh, uh, what we have created actually a blended finance solution uh, it seems to be working 
because we do give our grants separately from USAID, but in the blended finance solution, there are others. We have banks like Indusind Bank, we have uh, impact investors like Caspian, uh, other partners joining in as Rockefeller Foundation. And those monies can be used for different things. And the bank finances can be then guaranteed by say uh, other uh, Rockefeller or uh, some others. So in this way, I think it really works because uh, especially after the devastating second wave of COVID hit in April, May, actually we started uh, wholeheartedly this blended finance solution called Samrit. And already it's a hundred million plus fund with a lot of leverage, 18 uh, corporates and startups have already been funded. So it seems to be really working. So uh, USAID actually started this blended finance a year back, but on its own, it was really difficult to start. But as we uh, saw that uh, we have uh, all these different partners pooling in and touching different flavors of the risk guarantees and risk covers, I think that has really worked. So I believe that blended finance solution and within blended finance, there can be different uh, innovative solutions like uh, interest coverage and uh, uh, first loss guarantees and uh, even uh, some startup uh, grants all mixed together with the investment horizon of 10 to 15 years. Because USAID might pull back after three years, but then there are others. So that actually creates this market for private capital to flow in to the social sector, uh, primary healthcare and other sectors. So I think that has really started working. It's already in the field and working. So I'm really enthusiastic about it. Great. Over to you, Susan. Thanks. So I have one final question and then I'm gonna hand it over to Chris. So if you haven't put your questions in the chat yet, please do so. Um, so to Raninka and to Ankar, is there anything that USAID could do to be a better partner? Um, Susan, we've been partnering with uh, USAID for quite some time. Overall, I would say just, I mean, at the partnership of, I mean, uh, in terms of taking it forward, it has been working well because it's more technical partnership that we have uh, received a lot of expertise. But one thing overall, I just wanted to highlight, which I should have mentioned earlier as well, whilst we're talking about COVID, there is, it's, it's an essential need that we should not lose sight of other emerging conditions as well, because tuberculosis, I mean, it's one of the, uh, you know, it, the incidence rate in India is really, really high. And the uh, vision is to eradicate tuberculosis by 2025. So we've been working with USAID for, with regards to that because that's one of our areas as well. So whilst we're looking at COVID, we are looking at vaccination. We just wanted to highlight that these are conditions which are prevailing and we shouldn't uh, lose sight of. And in terms of, of course, um, with USAID only, we've tried to get more partners on board. So we, uh, we're on the corporate TV pledge uh, of the union and we've just tried to get more corporate players on on you know aligned with us we've actually managed to about get over nearly about 15 other corporate players as well uh to to join this so um as as we progress and there's been conversations about financing and all that stuff it just needs to be thought through a little more holistically in terms of let's just not look at covid covid is there it is existing of course it's really essential because we have possibly the, the fear of third wave going on but what we need to be very mindful of there are other things as well which are going you know on the side parallelly we should not lose sight of those so that's what i thought at least i'll tell you i mean i thought at least i'll summarize but uh, yes uh, with the i mean we're really fortunate to be partnering with usid uh, for uh, for in the healthcare segment Ankara, any comments? So yeah, we are also a part of the TV pledge and I think we are using our e-health centers and so far I think we covered 50,000, more than 50,000 uh, you know, patients, screen them for tuberculosis. There are two things I think uh, which uh, I think USAID and HPE can collaborate on. Rather, HPE would like USAID to help us collaborate on these two issues. One is that I don't think the vaccination regime is going to go away ever, frankly speaking. Yeah. What's going to happen is that the boosters would keep happening, the high risk would keep happening, you'll have variants of vaccine which would be as frequent as, let's say, flu doses or something of that sort. Uh, right now, in a country like India, flu vaccines are a very urban phenomenon. Mm. But Unlike that, uh, going uh, vac uh, vaccination for COVID is going to be more like a necessity. You know, it, it, it has to happen continuously. I, I can't see an end to it, frankly speaking. As the virus keeps mutating, 
the need to keep on having those antibodies to save yourself is going to be there forever. So the two areas where uh, probably USAID can help us is one, we'd like to reach, um, increase the reach of this model of ours. It's a, it's a tried and tested model. It's doing extremely well. Right now we're using our CSR funds and volunteering to do this. But there is only that much we can do. So now you have two options and, uh, and I, uh, in a lighter vein that one option is that you can help us collaborate with like-minded companies which can you know, do and come and do this with us. And the second option is you can get more business to us in India so that we can have a bigger CSR budget. So, so I'll leave this to you that which one of these <laughs> options would you like to choose? And, okay. And the, and the second request I have is that, uh, as I said previously, that help us make it better. This is only that much we can do. So we're happy to share our specs with anyone. We're happy to take them to our vaccination centers to show them how it works, to show the EMR. Please tell us how we can make it more, uh, you know, robust, how, more futuristic in that thing. If we can add on more equipment to it. Right now we do 70 diagnostic tests. Can we do more? So, so those are two requests which probably USAID can like act like a typical Indian matchmaker and help us, you know, do this. So, so those are two requests which I have, Susan, for you. So, yeah. Thank you so much. I want to thank the panelists, and I'm going to turn it over to Chris to moderate the um, audience Q&A. Right. Yeah, thank you. That was fascinating. Um, the initial question that came up is probably the most important from Fida Meran, which is um, how can the engagement that's been stimulated by COVID extend after COVID is no longer an emergency although as Ankara says, it's going to be with us, um, and also extend to topics beyond COVID, which Renika uh, raised as well, tuberculosis and other healthcare needs in that mobile population. And I just want to reiterate that Momentum, the US ARD uh, Momentum Program is looking for case study partners to help document that. So if there are any people listening who are interested in joining us in developing case studies, please do contact us. And clearly we, in Hewlett Packard and Apollo Tires, we, we have some good case studies to start with. Um, uh, Gautam, though, there are some additional questions also from FIDA for you, um, some of which may be easier to answer in the chat. But um, uh, two of them are around areas that USAID grants maybe cannot support. Are there any exclusions. Um, and the others are around the balance between um, stimulating health actors, healthcare providers, um, versus non-healthcare providers um, to, to support uh, these uh, health development initiatives. So do you have a comment on, on either of those two things? Yeah, maybe I can quickly uh, have uh, replied to both these. So there are certain areas. The fundamental thing is USAID grants cannot be mixed with something that earns returns, which means it cannot be mixed with equity. It cannot be uh, put in a pooled uh, resource which earns returns and there are dividends taken out. Of course, USAID does allow for project uh, income, but uh, nothing can be taken out, which means essentially we have to see that USAID grants are separate from investments. So USAID grant can go in uh, either as a small grant, more like a prize for doing something good and investments come separately, or USAID grant is more like a seed grant and uh, things like that. Also, USAID grant, grants cannot be directly used for loan guarantees, definitely not for first loss. Uh, even if it is partial loss guarantee, it has to be rooted through the DFC, the Development Finance Corporation and the MTU. So there are certain restrictions, but these things are needed. And if USAID uh, joins hands with other financiers, they can do it. And USAID grants can do the, uh, the good work, which doesn't produce revenue, and the revenue producing work can be financed, but in totality, the uh, enterprise gains. So that is what we can do. And uh, coming to the second question of what should be the balance, I think uh, this balance question comes because we tend to look at uh, engagement of private sector more from the downstream, the uh, front end, which is the people using the services. Once we within the USA start looking at it as an ecosystem approach, which includes everybody. So not just the users, but also the producers and the suppliers and all. Then there is no question of balance because in the ecosystem, 
you take one part out and the whole ecosystem collapses so there is always a potential and you, we can see that where the gap is and where do we come in gap can be at the supplier end manufacturer end uh, market developer end or the uh, consumer end so wherever the gap is we can come in either with our grants or in combination with others thank you great thank you very much gautam and I'm just looking at the time. So that rather than a question, this is a, um, a threat perhaps for Renika and Ankur that momentum will be um, coming, uh, knocking on your door to try and document the way you have uh, engaged with government and with other um, private sector partners to, to do your programming. And we'll be especially interested in what it would take uh, to continue um, your engagement beyond COVID uh, into other um, uh, areas of, of healthcare support and what type of engagement would take to sustain those efforts. Um, so I think we have had some really rich discussion in the panel that has really amplified, I think, the concepts introduced in those presentations. So I'm going to just hand back to uh, Susan now for the, the closing remarks so that we can uh, finish before the hour is up. Thanks, Chris. So um, first of all, I'd like to thank um, the panelists, particularly because I know it's the evening there. Um, so I'd like to thank you so much for your wisdom and sharing all the lessons of the great work that you're doing. Um, you know, once again, I think we've all, all the USAID panelists or, or participants have said how much we value our uh, work with the private sector. Uh, and want to continue to continually regularly engage and figure out how, um, you know, we could do things better. Um, as Chris said, if you are interested in contributing to or um, participating in the learning agenda that's been laid out, um, I believe Chris's contact is in the um, chat. If you're interested in learning more about what USAID India is involved in, you can either contact Gautam or Arvin. Um, and with that, I believe it's my pleasure to close the meeting. Um, I want to thank everyone. This is a very thought-provoking conversation, and I think um, you know, we want to bring lots of different types of private sector um, to share their experiences so that we can better understand how to engage. So with that, I think it's over to you, Julie. Thank you so much, Susan. Uh, we want to thank everyone for joining us today. And also, um, we would be grateful if you could kindly take just a minute or two to fill out the exit survey. And we will put that exit survey in the chat. But otherwise, thank you so much for joining us today. And we hope to see you again at another Market Links webinar soon. Thank you so much.